Okay, so thank you very much for joining this uh, Thursday session of the IFT seminars. Today we have with us uh, Oscar Macias from the Valley Institute in Tokyo and the Grappa Institute in Amsterdam, who will speak about electron positron acceleration by millisecond pulsars. Thank you. Okay, so thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity, and uh, it is a pleasure for me to be with you on this occasion. So the topic of my talk is going to be uh, so uh, our recent efforts to look for uh, evidence of electron positron acceleration by MSPs in different places of the galaxy. So, uh, so in particular, global clusters of the Milky Way and the center of our galaxy. So the motivation for this kind of analysis is twofold. Obviously, uh, millisecond pulsars are very interesting objects uh, themselves. But uh, also, uh, we are uh, so we have understood that millisecond pulsars are a very important source of astrophysical background for dark matter searches, uh, specifically for dark matter searches in the GV scale, TV scale, so this wind dark matter. And uh, in principle, uh, having a better knowledge of the emission mechanisms of millisecond pulsars could potentially allow us to gain uh, better access to the dark matter parameter space. And so those are the main motivations why we want to understand better the emission mechanisms of MSPs. So this talk is going to be divided in three main parts. In the first part, it will provide a very brief introduction to a topic. And then I will highlight our recent results, which were published in two different papers. So in the first paper, we present the results in which we look for this kind of uh, emission in global clusters of the Milky Way. And uh, lastly, we investigate the capabilities of the forthcoming Cherenkov telescope array for this kind of signals in the center of the galaxy. OK, so without further ado, let's start. So pulsars were predicted to be efficient accelerators of electrons and positrons as early as 1966. And fast forward in time, the hot collaboration detected extended gamma rays from the uh, two nearby objects. So in, in particular, Geminga and Monogem. So these are two normal pulsars or young pulsars that are uh, less than 300 parsecs away from, from our sun. So essentially they detected extended gamma rays from these objects and due to the age of these objects, the hadronic emission scenario for, uh, for these observations is disfavored and therefore the inverse quantum scenario in which basically these electrons and positrons of scatter ambient photons to higher energies is the preferred model for explaining the data from these two nearby objects. So these observations imply that normal pulsars are capable of accelerating electrons and positrons to multi-TV scale energies. So this is clear that normal pulsars or young pulsars are capable of definitely uh, accelerating electrons and positrons to such high energies. However, it is not that clear where millisecond pulsars, which are much older and evolved pulsars, can also uh, accelerate electrons and positrons to such high energies. And the reason essentially is that millisecond pulsars are known to have much weaker stellar surface magnetic fields. So while normal pulsars have magnetic fields, so typical magnetic fields of order uh, 10 to 12 Gauss, millisecond pulsars are known to have much weaker magnetic fields so of order 10 to 8 Gauss. So naively, uh, you would think that uh, uh, normal that millisecond, the emission mechanisms of uh, millisecond pulsars are very different to those of normal pulsars. All right, and and, and, and therefore the uh, capabilities for the uh, uh, highest energies that these MSPs can inject into these electrons are also uh, so it's 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 uh, so. Yeah, so we wonder about uh, the emission mechanisms of MSPs. So 
this illustration shows uh, a pulsar here. This uh, region here is the light cylinder. So this light cylinder is the region for which corrotated matter reaches the speed of light. And uh, these two regions, so the so-called outer gap and polar cap regions. So these are regions which uh, produce modes of emission mechanisms of uh, pulsars. So these are the regions for which these moles predicted that the high energy gamma rays come from. So these moles predicted that the gamma rays come from either the uh, outer gap or the polar cap uh, regions. And so these are regions in which the uh, in, in which the plasma density is much smaller than uh, the other places in the pulsar magnetosphere, and therefore the electric fields are less screened, and therefore uh, these are the most likely places for the high energy emission to come from. So these were the predictions from these previous models of uh, pulsar emission. However, these state-of-the-art models that uh, use these particle and cell simulations are actually predicting that the high energy emission comes from outside the light cylinder from some regions called the, for instance, the current sheet. And so if the regions in which this high energy emission is, uh, the, yeah, if the region outside the light cylinder, there are people like Alice Harding that are predicting that the emission mechanisms of MSPs should be very similar actually to those of young pulsars. So what happens basically is that these models predict that the high energy emission is independent of the pulsar rotation period and the actually and the surface magnetic fields. And so there are motivations essentially from uh, in recent modeling of pulsars that predict that uh, MSPs can accelerate electrons and positrons to very high energies, potentially multi TeV scale energies. Now, let's take a look now to the uh, observational evidence for these, for these kind of processes. So uh, we see here in Sudo et al. Uh, recently reported a correlation between the observations of a star formation rate, these are star forming galaxies, and the observed radio luminosity. And they noted that there is a nice correlation between the star formation rate and the observed radio luminosity from these uh, star forming galaxies for high star formation rates, but there is a breakdown of the correlation for low star formation rate. And uh, Seward basically posited that this breakdown of the correlation could be explained if MSPs accelerate electrons and positrons to GV scale energies. So this is indirect evidence for uh, efficient acceleration of leptons by MSPs in star-forming galaxies. Now also Cooper and Linden uh, recently uh, presented an updated analysis in which, we, in which they stacked Tirtisan MSPs in, in hot data. And they found in this stacking analysis that there is a four sigma significant detection for the so-called TV halos. So this is also uh, indirect evidence for uh, electron positron accelerations to multi TV energies. So potentially 100 TV scale uh, electrons, uh, multi, yeah, 100 TV scale energies for electron positrons. Now we also know that uh, glorious clusters of the Milky Way have a lot of millisecond pulsars. So glorious clusters are these very old. Uh, stellar structures, they have very high densities of stars, and therefore they can quite efficiently create millisecond pulsars. And so, and, so, and so one could expect that if these, uh, if MSPs can accelerate leptons to such energies, we could potentially uh, measure this kind of signal, so inverse Compton emission in glor clusters of the Milky Way. Now, the HES collaboration and the magic correlation, these are gamma ray detectors with TV scale energy sensitivities. They have tried to look for these uh, gamma rays from glory clusters, and they have only obtained upper limits on the gamma rays from these objects. So, 
And so, and so the question is why? And so, and so here in this first part of, in this part, in the first part of my talk, I'm going to basically show you our efforts to look for this inverse Compton emission using Fermi data from GLOR clusters of the Milky Way. So our results are presented in this paper. Uh, this paper was led by Dehan Song, who is a PhD student in the US. I am uh, his co-supervisor and some other microorators and Shaka Huriyuch in the US, Roland Crocker in Australia, and uh, David Nataf in the US as well. All right. So this is our sample for our analysis. So we used basically the so-called Harris catalog for GLORA clusters. There are 157 GLORA clusters in the Harris catalog, this is an astronomical catalog, which contains a lot of information about these GLORA clusters. And uh, we here show the uh, galactic position of these objects. So this is galactic, this is a sky projection in galactic coordinates. The uh, red stars are the GLOR clusters that are detected in gamma rays by the Fermilab collaboration. And the uh, green dots are the GLOR clusters which are not detected by the Fermilab collaboration. So essentially in our analysis, we reproduced the analysis by the Fermilab collaboration. So we also used 10 years of uh, data. We reproduced the results and then we uh, did some uh, analysis of uh, this data. And so I'm going to provide details of this, uh, this, uh, this analysis. So here we also show the three-dimensional position of these GLORA clusters. The center of the galaxy is shown here. The inner three kiloparsecs is marked by this uh, gray region here. And you can see that uh, most of the GLORA clusters are detected by the Fermilat collaboration. Uh, which are shown here by these red stars are relatively close to the sun and uh, some of all our clusters are actually in the inner galaxy, inner three kiloparsecs of the, of the center of the galaxy. So you can see that this is a sensor data problem in statistics in which you basically have a bunch of detections that are relatively uh, nearby to, uh, to you and then on other objects for which you are not detecting gamma rays, but it's probably due to the sensitivity dress code of the Fermi instrument, right? So this uh, gamma ray telescope. So the first thing that we do to try look for this evidence for inverse Compton emission from GLOR clusters is to do a correlation analysis. So this is a technique that has been used quite uh, efficiently by astronomers. So you just measure the gamma ray luminosities from these objects, and then you try find some correlations with some GLORA cluster properties, which uh, are told to have information about millisecond pulsars in, uh, in GLORA clusters. So in particular, we study the correlation between the major gamma ray luminosities and for instance, the stellar encounter rate, which is defined here. So the stellar encounter rate gives you the probability of stellar binary interactions. And these stellar encounter rate are uh, related to, in principle, to information mechanisms of MSPs. And so they give you an idea of the number of MSPs that can inhabit these global clusters. But we also look for a correlation between the gamma ray luminosity and the uh, interstellar radiation field energy density. So we account for the interstellar radiation field energy density of the Milky Way itself. So these are the uh, photon fields produced by the stars of all the galaxy, but also uh, we take into account the interstellar radiation field produced by the stars inside the glory cluster. So this is the uh, interstellar radiation field of the intracluster the intracluster uh, radiation field, and also the uh, metallicity of the glory cluster. So these two properties have uh, information of the formation mechanisms of MSPs in glory clusters, and these two uh, properties, so the interstellar radiation field, the total interstellar radiation field, and this uh, radiation field due to a Milky Way alone, uh, can have information of the emission mechanisms of these uh, gamma rays. So in particular, uh, detection of a correlation with, uh, uh, with the interstellar radiation field could mean 
uh, that there is inverse Compton emission being uh, produced by these MSPs in lower clusters. So we find, so we show here the significance for this correlation. So I should point out that uh, in our analysis for this correlation, we take properly into account the null observation. So meaning that we use some statistical methods, uh, in particular the Kendall tau correlation coefficient and the expectation maximization algorithm to uh, produce, to fit this uh, correlation formally to this data so that we account for the null detections uh, in, this, in this data. So this is a sensor data problem and we use the proper statistical methods to account for this for the sensor data. And these are basically the significance detection of this correlation. So we find uh, higher than five sigma significance detection for a correlation with the sterile encounter rate. And uh, there is a mild detection of a correlation with intercerulation material. So it is interesting. Uh, we are finding some significance detection of, with this uh, uh, stellar, uh, with this intercerulation field energy density which suggests an inverse Compton origin for these gamma rays uh, in lower clusters. But we also investigated potential healing correlations between the lower clusters parameters, uh, these lower cluster properties. So we found that there is actually a correlation between, the, uh, between these uh, stellar encounter rate and the torrent acceleration theory and density. So you can, uh, understand this by noticing that if there is a uh, higher uh, encounter rate, uh, uh, higher interaction rate, that means that there is also a higher density of the stars and therefore a higher uh, radiation field energy density in these objects. And so we found that there is a strong correlation with the, between these two properties. And it's possible that this hidden correlation between these two parameters explain why we are finding a mildly significant uh, correlation with interstellar pure and density. So, even though this is tentative evidence, it's not conclusive that we are finding areas for inverse Compton emission in global clusters. So, then in the second part of our paper, essentially, we try to then look for uh, evidence for this inverse Compton and therefore acceleration for electron positrons by MSPs by looking at the spectra. So. We analyze, so there are basically, as I mentioned, there are 30 lower clusters that were detected in gamma rays. We uh, did uh, a beam by beam analysis, uh, basically the same as the Fermilab coloration. And we try to, uh, to see where there is evidence for inverse Compton emission in the spectra from these objects. So essentially, the, so we try with two different spectral formulae. So these are phenological formulae that uh, is uh, taught to uh, describe these uh, physical processes. So for the curvature radiation, so the CR stands for curvature radiation, which is the prompt gamma rays. So these are the gamma rays that come from the stellar uh, surface. Uh, we use a power law with an exponential curve and phenomenologically, we model the inverse Compton emission with a simple power law. So first, we basically uh, fit with, this, with these two simple formulae, all the tier lower clusters that are detected by the Fermilab collaboration. Essentially, 25 of these objects are well explained by a simple, uh, by, sorry, by, a, uh, by this curvature radiation model, meaning this uh, power law with an exponential cutoff. And only five of them are uh, well explained by a simple power law. All right. So we also uh, show here our best fit parameters from this beam by beam analysis uh, of the spectra of these global clusters. And we compare the spectra of these global clusters. And we find that the spectra is actually very similar to the spectral properties of millisecond pulsars in the field. So these are millisecond pulsars in the galactic disk. And uh, so that basically supports the idea that uh, the gamma rays that are being emitted from these global clusters are indeed from uh, millisecond pulsars. But it is uh, still interesting to consider that since the intercellular radiation field in global clusters is so much higher than that in the interstellar, that, than that in the disk, that inverse Compton might still be important 
in these objects. So what we did then to try see where there is indeed inverse Compton emission, evidence for inverse Compton in these objects was to use a global fit analysis. So this is kind of an approximate version of a stacking analysis of all these global clusters. Essentially, we fitted to all the population of the, the stilted global clusters, the superposition of these two models, the uh, curvature radiation model and the inverse Compton model. So basically, as the statistics are so low, we were required to make some uh, approximations in our statistical analysis. So basically, we assume that there is a universal, an universal model that explains the, uh, all the GLOR clusters, all these stilted GLOR clusters. So basically, we fix the spectra, uh, the, the uh, slope and the energy cutoff in this formula, and then we vary, basically, we assume that these two normalizations are like nuisance parameters. And so basically these normalizations account for the fact that there can be a different number of NSPs in the global clusters or that the intercellation field in certain global clusters can be higher than ours. And doing this, we found that there is uh, a significant uh, preference for this two component model with respect to the uh, only the curvature radiation model, meaning that we find some uh, evidence for inverse Compton emissions, so for this power law, simple power law formula for these uh, global clusters. And uh, so we compare also our best fit parameters with those of the MSPs in the field, and we find that those are in agreement with those for the, at least for the best fit parameters of the curvature radiation model. But interestingly, uh, as I mentioned, there is this eight sigma significance detection for this inverse Compton component in the whole population of the stilted lower cluster, which is, which is interesting. So being able to measure the inverse Compton luminosity from these global clusters, we can make some interesting estimates about uh, the efficiencies of these millisecond pools. And so how efficiently these MSPs are accelerating electrons and positrons in global clusters. So essentially, uh, the curvature radiation or the prompt radiation, prompt gamma ray radiation is proportional to the spin down luminosity of the millisecond pulsars. And we also assume that the luminosity that goes into injecting electrons and positrons in lower clusters is proportional to the spin down luminosity of lower clusters. Now, if you take into account the fact that the magnetic fields in global clusters are relatively low, meaning that the energy losses are more important for the inverse Compton energy losses are more important than uh, synchrotron radiation energy losses in global clusters, then we can estimate the ratio of these efficiencies, meaning we can, uh, so in principle, we can estimate from our observations of global clusters the uh, ratio between the electron positron acceleration efficiency and the gamma ray efficiencies by measuring the inverse Compton luminosities and the prompt gamma ray luminosities from our universal fit to these global clusters. And we find indeed that the electron positron uh, acceleration efficiencies are between uh, a few percent and 10% if you assume that the uh, gamma ray efficiency is about 10%. So this 10% efficiency is a value that the Fermilab collaboration has reported in some previous papers in which they look at the population of MSPs in the field. They found that this F gamma is of order 10% and we're finding basically from our analysis that this is in agreement with our, uh, so that this, sorry, that this electron positron acceleration efficiencies in MSPs are between a few percent and 10%. Uh, these are our estimates from this, from this analysis. So another interesting uh, uh, conclusion that we get from our analysis is this correlation between the gamma ray luminosity and the stellar mass. So what we did here was basically we uh, measure the gamma ray luminosity from different regions of the sky where we can estimate the stellar mass. So we uh, put in this correlation 
the gamma ray luminosity versus the stellar mass of the Andromeda galaxy, the disk of the galaxy, the galactic bulge, and the nuclear bulge. So this nuclear bulge is are the stars in the inner 200 parsecs of the galactic center, and the galactic bulge are the stellar populations in the inner three or three kiloparsecs of, uh, of, of our galaxy. So now if you extend this correlation between the gamma ray luminosity and the stellar mass, you see here, and so these luminosities, these points here correspond to our uh, to the luminosities of the glory clusters. And so you see that these luminosities are about uh, a factor of 50 times above this extrapolated correlation. And so that is in agreement with our uh, knowledge about uh, millisecond pulsar formation in glory clusters, because we know that uh, since glory clusters have such high densities of stars, they are more efficient at creating MSPs and therefore at creating, at, MNA, at producing gamma rays. So this is in agreement with all what we know about uh, 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 formation scenarios for millisecond pulsars. So glory clusters are more efficient at creating gamma rays than, uh, than some other places in the galaxy. Now, so another thing that uh, we did in our analysis was to try to look for uh, the implications for forthcoming uh, TV scale uh, gamma ray detectors. So what you see here is a projection of for one particular glory cluster, so called Tersamphite, and so we extrapolated our best fit inverse Compton moiety to higher energies, and this uh, shaded uh, region here shows the variance which is obtained from the uh, uncertainties in the US feed power law component from all the population of glory clusters. Now, these red points here are the observations of Tersum 5 by the HES collaboration. So, so I should mention that uh, so Tersum 5 so far is the only glory cluster that has been detected at TV energies. And, uh, but uh, so there is a caveat, and is that the if you see the uh, gamma rays coming from the sun five, they actually do not coincide perfectly well with the with the position of the core of the Tersan five lower cluster. So what that means is that uh, so it's possible that these gamma rays are due to potentially, for instance, a uh, pulsar in the uh, foreground or uh, or so basically, there is uh, so it's not clear where these gamma rays coming from Tersan five, these TV scale gamma rays are belong to a glory cluster itself. So there is a caveat with this detection, and our modeling seems also to basically uh, so predict some much weaker inverse Compton than uh, those that is that are measured from this Tersan five. So. Also, uh, we uh, put here the sensitivities of the LASSO uh, gamma ray telescope and the point source sensitivity of the Cherenkov telescope array with only 100 hours of exposure. And you see that uh, it's potentially uh, difficult to detect these predicted inverse Compton uh, signals that, are, that come from, from our modeling of Fermilab data. So, uh, so it's interesting uh, what, uh, uh, so another comment that I wanted to make about uh, uh, Tersan 5 is that uh, there are uh, observations, astronomical observations that show that uh, the ages of stars in Tersan 5 are, uh, so the stars are relatively younger than in our glory clusters. And therefore it's possible that um, the, pulsars in Tersan 5 are also younger than in, in, in our glory clusters. And so it's possible that, uh, it's still possible that uh, these uh, gamma rays are in fact due to this glory cluster, uh, the, to uh, pulsars in this glory cluster, but then uh, it, it is not comparable with uh, the other, uh, with, 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 the, with our, our results because basically 
uh, most pulsars stars in global clusters are expected to be very old, are expected to be MSPs, and the electron positron acceleration efficiencies of MSPs are expected to be relatively lower than those of uh, young pulsars. All right. Okay, so then uh, now uh, let me move to the second uh, part of my talk, so the last part of my talk, which uh, is uh, has to do with trying to look for the signals in the center of our galaxy. So observations of uh, the center of our galaxy with the Fermilab detector has revealed an nexus emission so an excess emission on top of the astrophysical background that is not easily explained by our galactic diffusion emission models. So this is due, this is called the galactic center excess, and this has been very interesting and continues to be very interesting because of the possibility that this is the first non-gravitational detection of dark matter. Uh, this uh, detection was claimed first by Hooper going off in 2009. Since then, many different research teams have essentially confirmed the existence of this excess. And uh, uh, in my view, this is kind of a summary of the star of this galactic center. So at the spectrum, the galactic center excess, it is well explained. So this is the uh, photon uh, and photon field. Uh, sorry, the uh, spectrum or the photon energy density. The spectrum of this of this uh, of, of this gamma ray signal. So this is the energy uh, and the spectrum of the galactic center excess is well explained by a simple power law with an exponential curve. So basically. Uh, curvature radiation from a large number of millisecond pulses in the center of the galaxy can easily explain these observations or WIMP self annihilations. Uh, so, WIMP particles with masses between 30 GeV and 60 GeV can also easily explain these observations. So, basically, self annihilation with, uh, with the thermal cross section can explain these observations, this spectrum at least. Now, if you look at the spatial morphology of the signal, originally it was thought that the best fit spatial morphology for the galactic center excess was that uh, of the Navarro frame wide profile. So basically, the uh, that matter distribution of which, which is which is due to which is uh, as, as predicted by these contracted Navarro frame wide profiles. Now, in some recent analysis, we have shown that actually, if you take the stellar distribution of the galactic bulge and compare that in a fit with those of dark matter, we have shown that these galactic bulge maps do a better job at explaining the spatial morphology of the gamma rays than those of dark matter. And so these basically support, strongly support the millisecond pulsar hypothesis for the galactic center excess, and this favors the dark matter explanation for the galactic center excess. So another uh, line of research, which is very active, consists on looking for potential uh, clustering of photons. Uh, so basically people look at the photon count statistics, and people try and look for evidence of on result point sources in the data. So basically look for clustering of photons in the data. People use different techniques such as the non-Poisonian fit technique, the wavelet methods, and all these methods, are, although there is no uh, consensus in the community, these uh, methods are very promising. And, but uh, I truly stress that those methods are in principle independent of all these different uh, analyses that, uh, look at the spectra and the spatial morphology. And so uh, currently, in my view, these two uh, signals strongly disfavor the art matter explanation for the lactic center excess, despite the fact that there is no yet consensus on the results that are coming from this other line of research. All right. So also, so people have looked, and so people are basically looking at some other alternatives to try to resolve this puzzle in the center of the galaxy. And uh, uh, the, our community is basically convinced that to, put, to definitely solve this puzzle, we need to look at other wavelengths. And so, uh, for instance, Calor et al. did a projection analysis in which basically they found 
that forthcoming radio telescopes such as SKA can have the sensitivity to resolve potentially hundreds or even thousand, thousands of these MSPs that give rise to the galactic center excess. And also we know that MSPs uh, produce also a lot of uh, X-rays, non-thermal and thermal X-rays. And there are correlations, the biblical correlation between the gamma ray luminosity and X-ray luminosity from MSPs. And so recently, Bertal Dral did an analysis in which basically they show that several unassociated point sources in X-ray data taken by Chandra, for instance, uh, can be some of these MSPs that give rise to the galactic center excess. So, 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 uh, so there is hope that we can resolve this puzzle of the galactic center excess by looking at other wavelengths. And what we do in this in this paper here is similar uh, in in so is similar in method to this kind of analysis. Now we look at the sensitivity of the forthcoming Cherenkov telescope array to these millisecond pulsars in the center of the galaxy. So this is what we do. So basically, so we know the Cherenkov telescope array is going is currently being commissioned and constructed. Is uh, hoped uh, so. Uh, we hope that it's going to start operating in 2022 and it's going to have incredible sensitivity in the energy range between 10 GeVs and 100 TVs and, uh, uh, and uh, great uh, spatial resolution between 0.2 and 0.02 degrees so to the uh, art second scale uh, spatial resolution by this, uh, by this instrument. So we also know that the southern instrument is going so the the one that is going to be built in Chile is going to be uh, more sensitive to the center of the galaxy and the CTI collaboration recently uh, uh, posted a paper published a paper in which they outlined their plans for observations of the center of the galaxy so we know that the CTI is a pointing instrument but they have a very clear plan for observing diffuse, truly diffuse gamma rays from the center of the galaxy. And the idea is basically to stitch together several pointing observations, several uh, images to reconstruct basically uh, diffuse gamma rays from the center of the galaxy. All right, so with that, basically we are able to, in principle, we should be able to find the high energy tail of these uh, millisecond pulsars that explain the galactic center excess. So essentially the idea is that these MSPs are going to accelerate electrons and positrons to potentially TV scale energies as we have uh, seen from uh, this previous analysis from global clusters and some other places and will potentially give uh, a signal that is detectable by CTI. And so uh, what we use in this paper is basically we, uh, create simulated data for uh, with CTA, and then we analyze the simulated data with uh, our statistical pipeline. And these are basically the outline of our analysis. We analyze the inner 10 by 10 degrees regions of, our, of, of the sky. We mask the inner 0 0.3 degrees region uh, the, basically the galactic plane, the 0 0.3 degrees region up and above the galactic plane. We also mask some hard point sources that are expected to meet some uh, gamma rays at, for, uh, that are observable by CTA. And we assume some reasonable uh, exposure time by uh, of this region of the sky of 500 hours. And we use this uh, energy range between 16 GV and 150 TV. So, since we don't yet have any observations of the diffuse gamma rays from the center of the galaxy, our approach is simulating the sky with uh, some cosmic ray propagation, with a cosmic ray propagation code. So there are excellent uh, possibilities out there. The dragon code is an excellent possibility. Also, the uh, GAL probe is an excellent possibility for this. And we choose in our analysis uh, the latest version of GAL probe, which has some state-of-the-art models for the uh, structure of the galaxy and also for the interstellar radiation field uh, in, in uh, for, yeah, three dimensional models for the interstellar radiation field. Um, so these are our parameters, the propagation parameters that we choose. These are some well-motivated parameters that were proposed by Johansson et al. 2019. 
and they, these are in principle compatible with a multitude of different uh, cosmic ray observations and gamma ray synchrotron observations. And uh, these are the results of our simulation. So basically, we create some inverse quantum maps, which are divided in different galactocentric rings. So the idea of dividing these maps in energy and also in space is due to the fact that we expect there to be a lot of systematic uncertainties in the injection uh, spectrum of these cosmic rays, cosmic ray densities, the amount of gas, uh, etc. And the Fermilab collaboration have shown that this idea of dividing the maps in different galactocentric rings allows you to uh, uh, basically account for those uncertainties uh, when you are doing the statistical fits. And so we take this approach uh, to as uh, knowledge is the fifth time this has been done with simulated CTI data. And we basically show that this uh, exactly the same approach uh, that is very successful in analyzing formula data is also can also be successful for analyzing CTA data, which is very interesting. Now, our approach basically here is to uh, do a very realistic analysis of uh, the galactic diffuse emission. So, we in previous uh, in a previous paper we have shown that some hydrodynamical gas maps for the galactic center are better than the traditional interpolated gas maps used by, for instance, the Fermilab collaboration or GAL probe. Uh, and, 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 and so our approach here is basically creating simulated data with one, uh, with one model for the gas and then fitting the data with a completely independent model, like, for instance, these hydrodynamical gas map models uh, this simulated data. So we feed the data with a completely independent model. And with this way, we mock up a scenario in which we don't have a perfect modeling of the galactic diffuse emission. So these are the, uh, uh, the different uh, gas maps that we have. So this is the uh, atomic hydrogen, molecular hydrogen. These are the dust uh, residuals that we use. Uh, I should point out that these maps these hydrodynamical uh, gas maps, we have made them fully clear in this GitHub. Please take a look at them if you're interested. And uh, also for uh, another potentially important component in the center of the galaxy are the Fermi balls. So these are some giant lobes extending up to seven kiloparsecs up from the galactic plane. And the, these models are proposed by the Fermilab collaboration. Initially, they propose a very simple model for the, fer, for the Fermi balls in the inner galaxy, these catenary templates. But then the Fermilab collaboration improved on this by showing also the structure of these uh, fl of the flux, uh, the Fermi balls. And these regions that you see here marked in uh, green are some regions that are some artifacts. Uh, that are due to a masking of the point sources. So there are a lot of point sources here in this sky, uh, in, the, in the sky and uh, in the region of the sky, and they mask this region to uh, not bias their analysis. So what we did in some previous papers was we used some interpolation techniques to reconstruct these images here, and we show that this map, this reconstructed image, does a better job at describing the Fermi balls uh, in, in the inner galaxy, and we went with that for our uh, CTA sensitivity analysis. So for the spectra, what we did was we took the major spectra at the Fermilab collaboration and we simply extrapolated that spectra to TV scale energies. So we show here basically that the, so these are our gas correlated gamma rays, inverse Compton models. We make sure that these models agree with the measurements by Fermilab of these components. And we use two different models for the Fermi balls. One, one model that we call the FB min and the FB max, Fermi balls minimum and Fermi ball maximum. So basically these two models are expected to account for the uncertainties in the emission of these Fermi balls at the T scale energy. So we have, of course, not observed the Fermi balls at TV energies, but we are here trying to account for the potential systematics 
uh, for the potential uncertainties in this in, in the mission. Then what we did was we uh, convolved all these models with the instrument response function and the uh, expected con rates that are going to be measured by CTA are shown here. This line here shows the uh, cosmic ray, the irreducible cosmic ray background. So one interesting thing is, uh, of course, the reusable cosmic ray background is expected to dominate over a large uh, fraction of the energy range. But uh, we should also point out that the spatial morphology of this irreducible cosmic ray background is very different to that of the spatial morphology of the astrophysical sources. And so using the uh, spatial morphology and the uh, very sensitive spatial resolution of the CTA, we can anyway uh, have sensitivity potentially to these uh, signals that uh, are much weaker than the irreducible uh, cosmic ray background, which is very interesting. So these are the details for the, our simulations of these millisecond pulsars. So basically we assume that these MSPs are distributed as the stars in the galactic bulge. And then we uh, assume that there is a, a, a mean luminosity function that explains the, so there is a mean injection luminosity of these electrons and positrons in the center of the galaxy. And we model that with a, an exponential cutoff, which is, uh, which resembles basically the curvature radiation for MSPs. And so what we did was, okay, so we know that this uh, electron positron luminosity is a fraction of the spin down luminosity of the MSPs. And we uh, know that this efficiency of prompt gamma rays is about 10%. These are measurements by the Fermilab coloration. And so what we can do here is we can uh, basically estimate the electron positron luminosity in terms of the major gamma ray luminosity of the galactic center excess. And so what we can do essentially is to, uh, to work with the simulated data and look for the sensitivity. So what are the electron positron acceleration fractions that are needed for CTA to be able to reliably detect the uh, high energy tail of the galactic center excess, right? So this is what we do. In some previous analysis, we did some dedicated theoretical analysis in which we show that the spatial morphology of the inverse quantum, depending of the uh, sources that emit these electrons and positrons are very different. So if you assume, for instance, that the uh, that is dark matter, which is which is you assume that it is a spherically symmetric distributed and is accelerating electrons and positrons, and uh, so you get some inverse Compton emission, which are morphologically different than those that you expect from MSPs if the MSPs are distributed as the stars in the galactic bulge. So as I mentioned. The galactic bulge has a very, uh, has a boxy bulge morphology, has a boxy shape uh, distribution, and that difference in the spatial morphology of that matter and the stars or MSPs uh, give, uh, so predict an inverse quantum signal that is morphologically different. So you see here, these are uh, inverse quantum profiles for the spherical source, and here for a source that is distributed as the stars. So in principle, a TV energy, so basically you see here that as the energy increases, the morphological differences between the two sources also increase. And so we can use that fact essentially to detect, to potentially distinguish the millisecond pulsar signal from the arc matter signal. Okay, so this is what we do. So I'm going to accelerate now. Uh, so what we do is we uh, create this mock data. Uh, we take these uh, astrophysical models that we have and we convolve those with the CTA instrument response function. And then we inject the millisecond pulsar signal. And this is the mock data that we have. You see here that we are masking the galactic plane. We are also masking these, uh, these point sources. And then we try to see where our statistical analysis is able to recover the injected millisecond pulsar signal. We see the results here. 
uh, for two scenarios. So we have this optimistic scenario and we have the conservative scenario. So you see here in the in the x axis the injected luminosity and this is the recovered luminosity by our statistical analysis. And you see here the test statistics for the for the source. So this uh, level here corresponds to the five sigma significance threshold. This five sigma corresponds to a TS that is larger than the TS of 25 because we have 11 degrees of freedom. So we are using a beam by beam analysis and so we have uh, a large number of degrees of freedom and this is the TS that corresponds to a five sigma significant detection. So in the optimistic scenario, basically we model the astrophysical background with the same model. So we create the mock data and we feed the mock data with the same model that we use to create in, for creating the mock data. Instead here, we create the mock data with one model, with one astrophysical background model, and then feed the data with a, an independent astrophysical model. So we are mocking up the scenario in which you don't have a perfect model for the uh, cosmic ray, for the hadronic emission, uh, or Brenstralum gamma rays from, this re from, from the region of the sky. And we show here that in this mismodeling case scenario, the sensitivity of the Chernikov telescope array decreases by about one order of magnitude in this very conservative scenario. But still, uh, you see here that uh, above this luminosity, the injected luminosity is the one that you recover with your statistical method. So we show here the minimum fluxes that are required for a reliable detection by CTA of this population of MSPs that explains the galactic center excess in the optimistic scenario. And you see here that the minimum fluxes increase by out an order of magnitude in the conservative scenario, which you have these Fermi balls that are very bright and that you have this uh, mismoling of the galactic diffuse emission. So we also show here for different injection models. So we inject the electron positron with different spectra and we see what is, uh, and so here we show the electron positron acceleration efficiencies uh, uh, as, uh, as we change basically the, the uh, injection models. So you see here that there are some injection models that are that could be more easily detectable by CTI. And so this injection one model is this one. So you see that the slope, the gamma, the gamma parameter is relatively small. And so this is a hard spectra. And the hard spectra is uh, we are getting that CTI is able of disentangling this hard spectra from uh, the astrophysical background. And that's because the astrophysical background is, is very soft. And so when the injection spectra is very soft like this injection two, then the, uh, the efficiencies become very large. So that means that CTA, if the injection spectra has, is very soft, CTA is going to be very difficult for CTA to detect this, uh, this signal. So lastly, the, uh, so the other thing that we wanted to investigate was where CTA could distinguish between the two hypotheses that have been proposed for the galactic center excess. So these are dark matter and music composers. So as uh, I have shown, the MSPs are, are going to have a different spatial distribution to that of dark matter. And we can use that fact to see where uh, their inverse Compton emission uh, produced by dark matter and the MSPs are recognizable by CTA. So in the, what we did here was we injected a millisecond pulsar signal and then in the feed we nested, we included a dark matter model. And so we tried to see where the dark matter component could absorb some of the injected millisecond pulsar signal. And we show that uh, the, uh, our statistical pipeline, is, so the CTA is able to recognize the millisecond pulsar component from the, uh, from the dark matter component. So essentially for high luminosities, the CTA is quite capable of recognizing, distinguishing between dark matter and MSPs in, this, in, the, in the center of the galaxy. All right, so 
these uh, so these are so I so I get to the uh, last slide for my talk and so these are my conclusions. So as we have shown, there is some tentative evidence for electron positron acceleration by MSPs in lower clusters of the Milky Way. This is at the moment tentative and requires, and so we are hoping to use some more robust statistical uh, methods to confirm this potential detection. So uh, please stay tuned. This is, uh, I, I, th I think this is interesting evidence uh, at the moment. And we have also investigated the capabilities of the Cherenkov telescope array to uh, detect the millisecond pulsars that uh, originate the galactic, that potentially originate the galactic center excess. And we have shown that for physically plausible electron positron acceleration efficiencies, CTA can have the sensitivity to detect this, this signal. And uh, we have implemented some uh, statistical methods in our analysis that uh, have been very successful in analysis of Fermi data. And we have uh, found, interestingly, that these methods could work very well also for CTA science. So those are, uh, so I'm happy to take now questions and uh, feedback. Okay, so thank you very much. Are there questions? I may have a few indeed, Michele. Yes, perfect. Okay, yeah, thank you, Oscar. First, thank thank you. You to congratulate you for the talk. Uh, oh, very interesting you. stuff, as usual. Uh, I'm very happy to, to have you here, of course. Okay. Uh, so I have, a, I have a question regarding the, the first part of your talk. Great. Um, yeah, you, you mentioned very often the spectral part, no? the spectral analysis that you perform for, for, the, for, the, for the case of the municipal pulsars in, in global clusters. Right. Do, you, do, you, do you have anything to say about spatial, a possible spatial analysis? Does an spatial analysis say something in this case? Or, or is right. Well, yeah, so at least for the global clusters, we uh, did an extension analysis. So we tried to look for areas of uh, extended gamma rays from these global clusters. And what we found was that uh, they all were consistent with a point source. So we didn't find uh, evidence for these uh, extended gamma rays in these global clusters, but it's possible that this is just due to the fact that these global clusters are relatively far away. And so it's possible that with uh, a better instrument like uh, for instance, uh, an instrument with the sensitivity of CTA, uh, it, it, it could still be possible to detect extended gamma rays from global clusters. Indeed, I, I had this question at the very beginning when you when you mentioned that um, the discovery of TV halos, no? Uh, these TV halos, do you expect any kind of GV halos? How, or with Fermi? Fermi right. Yeah, oh. well, yes, so that's very, that's very interesting. So I know that Machia Di Mauro has made a claim mm -hmm. of, uh, yep. uh, of, of a uh, GV hello in a few MSPs, or sorry, I think it was in some young pulsars. Uh, but so far, I have not seen any work, I think, for MSP. So, de so definitely, Machili Mauro has this claim for a young pulsar with Fermi yes. data. Yeah. But uh, so I haven't, I haven't seen that for MSPs. And uh, so I think, so one interesting, one interesting thing that uh, Cooper and Linden did in this analysis was they use, so they selected this 37 MSPs based on uh, the distance from the sun and also the spin down luminosity. So these, all these MSPs are uh, relatively close or are basically within, within two kiloparsecs of the sun. And so I think it will potentially be interesting to look at these MSPs uh, or in the, in the GV scale. But yeah, I'm not aware of any kind of attempts uh, for GV scale emission from MSPs or from, from, yeah, from TV hello, sorry, GV hellos from MSPs. Yeah, but do you know if the theoretical models of the, of the you know, the emission mechanisms in these, in these objects, no? Do you know if these theoretical models actually allow for this kind of GV standard emission or, or this is not expected? Or, or, right, yes. Um, 
Well, yeah, so I think, uh, so at the moment, uh, this, so my impression from reading all these uh, reviews of pulsar acceleration, uh, so my so my take from Green, for instance, this recent review by Harding, is that uh, definitely MSPs can accelerate these electrons and positrons to GV scale and potentially multi TV energies, and so I think it is expected from these recent models that there should be also T, uh, GV halos from MSPs. So basically, the idea is that uh, so the, so what I have understood is that there is a change in the paradigm of understanding of the emission mechanisms of these MSPs, and uh, basically these new models break that this high-energy emission comes from outside the light cylinder. This is due to this magnetic reconnection that uh, basically increases the magnetic field here outside the light cylinder, and what these people, these experts on pulses, are uh, predicting is that the emission mechanisms of ion pulsars should be very similar to that of MSPs, millisecond pulsars. So I expect MSPs also to have GV hellos, TV hellos, and, and also synchrotron hellos. Okay, this is very interesting because as you know, for instance, I mean, we are, we are doing a lot of work on dark matter stuff in our group. And one of our, of our possible smoking guns no, that we are exploring is this special emission that you expect for dark matter objects. Right. While we thought we shouldn't expect this kind of spa, special emission in, in at GV energies right. from pulsars, for instance, no, that can mimic the dark matter, right? So yeah. this, is, this is particularly you know, important for, for us, for studies like ours. You're right, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's very interesting, yes. Yeah, thank you. Okay. More questions? I may have a naive one from an outsider. Oh, please go ahead. So uh, is it understood why these uh, millisecond pulsars have a smaller magnetic fields than the normal ones? Well, yeah, so, so basically, so what these people argue is that, okay, so these MSPs are, are the result of binary interaction. So the idea is that these, uh, in the recycling, uh, in the formation scenario called the recycling scenario, you have this uh, pulsar which uh, uh, obliterates the uh, stellar companion, basically accretes matter from the stellar companion. And uh, the uh, conventional scenario is that as a process of accreting mass from the stellar companion, the magnetic field gets screened and therefore the magnetic field becomes smaller. So, that is, I think, the conventional scenario for why these magnetic fields are smaller than in younger, younger pulsars. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you should also expect uh, X-ray emission from jets and things like that. That is correct. Yes. And so basically uh, in that, in that, in that, in that uh, epoch in which the pulsar is accreting mass, it's called the low mass X-ray binary. And so they are very active at producing X-rays, definitely. Yes. So then the focus in your talk on the millisecond pulsars, uh, is it because they are expected to be uh, more abundant in, in regions with all the stars or? That's correct. That's precisely. So, so, so it's not, not because it's not because you need an acceleration for TV, which is uh, given by strong magnetic fields, but because actually you expect uh, most of the pulsars in, in certain regions to be millisecond pulsars. That's correct. So, so that's correct. So, the, so one of the motivations for this MSPs is that MSPs, so these more evolved pulsars, have been proposed as a leading theory for explaining the galactic center itself. So what happens in the galactic center is that this emission, this uh, excess has been observed up to very high latitudes actually to uh, even 10, even beyond 10 degrees in latitude of the galaxy. Now here, the star, the population of the stars in the galactic bulge are very old, and there is no uh, that there is no much star formation activity in the galactic bulge, which uh, which means that uh, these uh, pulsars should be significantly older than the pulsars in the galactic disk. Okay. So we expect that MSPs are going to be more important source of background in the center of the galaxy than in all places of the galaxy, where okay. there is a star formation. Yeah, okay, thank you. thank you. Sure. 
practicing questions. Yeah. More questions? Okay, so thank you very much once again for this nice talk and uh, goodbye to everybody. Okay, thank you, Oscar. Thank you so much for having me and for the wonderful uh, discussions and feedback. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Muchas gracias a todos. Hasta luego.